questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The clean energy target has never been Labor's preferred position, but we are willing to work with the government in the national interest. Members on my right. Will the Prime Minister now commit to work with Labor Leader in the, the opposition national will interest? His seat. Members on my right are preventing me hearing the question. The I didn't pick whoever said that, but whoever it is, consider yourself lucky. The opposition, the opposition leader will resume his question again, and members on my right will not interject. I need to hear the question. The Leader of the Opposition will begin his question again. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. The clean energy target has never been Labor's preferred position but we are willing to work with the government in the national interest. Will the Prime Minister now commit to work with Labor in the national interest to end the policy paralysis which has led to higher electricity prices and instability in the energy market? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank, well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it's always very busy in the lead-up to question time, and I know the Leader of the Opposition was rushing out of his office and he grabbed the speech notes for the midwinter ball instead of for question time. What a, what a phony act of sincerity we had there. How unconvincing, how unconvincing. So much bipartisanship from the Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, let's be very clear about this. Labor's track record on energy has delivered higher prices and insecurity. Now then, let me run through. Let me run through, Mr. Speaker, some of the great the achievements for Griffith is of the Labor Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Labor Party has always made it their case that they prefer to put a tax on carbon. That has always been their preferred position. Right? That's been their position federally. And of course, and of course, the Mr. member for Speaker, Rankin and the member for what Kingston. They have done since then, what they have done since then, in whether it is with respect to gas or renewable energy, is put Australians, businesses and households at risk with higher prices and less secure electricity. The track record in South Australia, delivered by a Labor government over many years, is probably the most egregious. Where they build up an enormous wind reserve and no, no storage at all. No backup at all. Didn't even think about it. Completely mindless, thoughtless. All ideology, all politics, all slogans, no economics, no engineering. And then, Mr Speaker, we see their achievements with gas. And Mr Speaker, let's reflect on this. Under the last federal Labor government and under a Queensland Labor government, they succeeded in allowing for the export of gas from Queensland. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. And new coal seam gas uh, resources were tapped into. Fair enough. But did they give any thought to the domestic market? No. no. Not at all. Again, thoughtless, mindless. Got us into the situation where we have more of our gas being exported every day and to the point where Australian businesses, Australian industries, Australian households were being asked to pay more for gas than their customers of the gas exporters in Japan were. That is the consequence of Labor's approach to energy, thoughtless, slipshod political ideology, no economics, no engineering. We're delivering for Australian households affordable, secure energy and meeting our emission commitments. Just before I call the member for Robertson, I'm not going to keep every question time. The member for Chifley will cease interjecting. I'm not going to keep every question time reminding members uh, not to interject and then to warn them. The member for Perth is interjecting incessantly. He'll cease interjecting if he wants to stay in question time, as will the member for Bruce and the member for Kingston and Rankin as well. And I call the member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. 
Will the Prime Minister update the House on action the government is taking to guarantee and fund the vital services that Australians rely on, such as the National Disability Insurance Scheme? Is the Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, yes thank, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for her question. And as the honourable member knows, the National Disability Insurance Scheme is a great national enterprise, introduced under a Labor government with the full support of the coalition. Truly a bipartisan achievement. And when it was introduced, when it was in, that's, that's real bipartisanship. That is a commitment to supporting it. And when the Labor Party called on the opposition, the coalition in those days, to support a half a percent increase in the Medicare levy to pay for the NDIS, we supported it. We gave them that support. But Labor did not fund the NDIS. They left a $55 billion hole in the NDIS. Their recklessness, their financial negligence mocks the empathy they claim to have. Dripping with sanctimony and empathy, but no resources, no resources to put behind the NDIS. And Mr Speaker, we're delivering on that. We're taking the tough decisions. We've sought savings elsewhere in the budget. We've not been able to get them through the Senate. We are taking the tough decision to raise the, the Medicare levy by another half a per cent to fully fund the National Disability Insurance Scheme. And Mr Speaker, I was delighted today, as I, with the Treasurer, the Minister for Social Services, the Assistant Minister for Disabilities, with stalwart ad advocates for, the, for people with disabilities, John Delabosca from Every Australian Counts, Ara Creswell from Carers Australia, Catherine McClellan from National Disability Services, and Kirsten Dean from the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations. They have come to Canberra to ask the Labor Party and the crossbenchers to support the, the, N, the Medicare levy increase of half a per cent to fully fund the NDIS. They came with a big, there's a big poster there, a message to the Treasurer, fully fund the NDIS. What's our answer? Yes, we're delivering on it. We're prepared to fund it. Labor is not. And Mr Speaker, how can they look? into the eyes of mothers of children with disabilities. How can they do that? Oh, yes, yes, filled with hypocrisy, the Labor Party. All empathy, no resources. All empathy, no responsibility. We're funding the NDIS. Labor should support it. They know we're right. Three quarters of the shadow cabinet knows we're right. Labor, it's about time the politics comes to an end. And on this issue, this, this new master of bipartisanship gives a demonstration of supporting that great national project, backing in that great exercise, that national enterprise of practical love, the of Prime solidarity, Minister's time of commitment with has real money. Concluded. The member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My questions to the Prime Minister. On 1 July, AGL electricity prices in New South Wales will go up by 16 per cent. With power prices going up, why is the Prime Minister cutting the $365 a year energy supplement for pensioners, a cut that will make it even harder for pensioners to stay warm in the wintertime? The Minister for Social Security. So the question, I thank the member for her question, Mr. Speaker, and the question is with respect to the energy supplement, supplement otherwise um, referred to as the compensation for the carbon tax. Of course, the carbon tax was only in for the briefest period of time. The carbon tax also had the habit, of course, of driving electricity prices right up. We all remember that. What the, uh, what the member, what the member now complains of, Mr. Speaker. What the now, what the now member now complains of, Mr. Speaker, is government policy the for to Shortland end the warned. supplement that was meant to compensate for a tax that didn't actually go ahead. And what the member fails to tell the House is, what the member fails to tell the House is, that the savings that are achieved from that measure 
the Labor Party has already banked and spent. And when, when you have a look, Mr Speaker, at Labor's fiscal plan, they are absolutely explicit in their fiscal plan. At page 30, at page 30, they are absolutely explicit on all the measures which we have openly and transparently said that we would pursue and which they said they would reverse. And there's the big long list of them. They would reverse not proceeding with applying one week's ordinary waiting period. They'd reverse not proceeding with changes to pension portability. The list goes on. Mysteriously absent from the list is the energy supplement. Mysteriously absent from the list is the energy supplement. So just like, just like the changes to the pension asset test, we all remember that when the member for Jagger Jagger's party announced during the election campaign they, they were supporting it. The minister will resume it. his seat you know, for a second. Members on my right will cease interjecting the member for Hume, in particular the member for Jagger Jagger, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On relevance, the minister the could at min least member talk for Jagger about Jagger resume her seat. The minister for Jagger Jagger will resume her seat. <laughs> no, I haven't called. I haven't called the minister yet. I'm waiting for interjections from the member for Isaacs to cease. The minister has a call. Mr Speaker, members on this side of the House think it's quite relevant when members on that side complain about a savings measure they've already banked and spent. It's like we actually think that's, uh, as a matter of fiscal management, quite, quite relevant. And the point is the member for Jagger Jagger is probably the single greatest threat to this country ever returning to surplus because there's not a saving measure that she has ever agreed with. The press release comes out before the savings measure is even thought of, binding the shadow cabinet to whatever the member for Jagger Jagger thinks is the case. And that's why the member for Jagger Jagger gets herself into these awkward situations, such as her party agreeing to a change to the pension assets test at the same time for several weeks that she's collecting signatures on a petition opposing it. So what do you say to the pensioners? What did you do with those signatures? What do you say to the pensioners whose signatures you're collecting opposing a measure you support? What do you say to the House complaining about a savings measure you've already banked and spent? So next time you get up, you better work out whether you actually support it, whether you don't support it, whether you're going to support it, whether you oppose it. There are so many positions here, it's more like Bikram yoga. The member for Brisbane. The member for Brisbane has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. Will the Minister update the House on the importance of fully funding the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Social Services. What we noted today, as the uh, Prime Minister knows, we had several uh, representatives from the disability community, and they spoke with one voice. And what they said was they wanted this Parliament, they wanted this Parliament to agree to fully fund the NDIS through the levy. The Prime Minister mentioned several of those. One of the advocates that he didn't mention was Juan del Toro, del Toro, who was from the National Ethnic Disability Alliance. John de la Bosca made a number of very important statements. What he said was that it is now time to fully fund the NDIS and, in his words, to ensure that the changes are absolutely intergenerational, that what we can ensure is that the young children that we saw today have absolute certainty of funding going forward. What members opposite have said is two things. One is that there should be an increase in the Medicare levy, but only for those above $87,000. And they've also said, through the shadow treasurer, that they will not spend that money on the NDIS. And you know what it is if you apply it to people over $87,000 and don't fund it on the NDIS? It is a brand new and novel type of class warfare where you declare war on the middle class. You declare war on aspirational people who are trying to get ahead earning over $87,000. And what's fair about that? What is fair about saying to a teacher with five years' experience in New South Wales that they alone should pay a 0.5 per cent increase in the Medicare levy, and a teacher with four years' experience in New South Wales should not have to pay any increase in the Medicare levy? What on earth is fair about that? What we have devised is a system which all of these disability advocates absolutely agree is fair, and the reason why it's fair is because it asks every Australian who is paying the Medicare levy 
with all of the exemptions that are inside the system to pay according to their ability. So a person on $180,000 might have an income only six times greater than a person on a lower income in the system, but they would pay 12 times more. And what the Labor Party does in asking a teacher with four years' experience to contribute nothing and asking a five-year teacher experience to cont contribute under the Medicare levy is not only do they misrepresent people's capacity to pay, but they misrepresent people's goodwill and capacity to want to pay and fund the NDIS. Now, finally, Mr Speaker, one of the advocates we had today, as I mentioned, was Juan del Torre from the National Ethnic Disability Alliance. And he had some very interesting things to say to me, and he asked if I would pass a message on to the Leader of the Opposition. I said to him, you know what, I've got just the time that we can do that. And here it is. Leader of the Opposition, Juan de Torre said that you would remember him, you would remember him from your parliamentary secretary days. And his message was very simple, and in his words, he wanted you to get fair dinkum and be like you used to be and the support funding Minister's for the NDIS. Members on my right. The Minister for Small Business will cease interjecting, as will the Minister for Transport. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. As the Prime Minister knows, wholesale electricity prices have doubled under the Liberal government. The Australian Energy Council has said, and I quote, the lack of national policy certainty is now the biggest driver of higher electricity prices. Does the Prime Minister agree? And will the government commit to working with Labor to end four years of policy paralysis under this government, which has led to higher prices and instability in the energy market? Yeah. The Prime Member for Gilmore is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the, the recent increase in wholesale electricity prices is the consequence of years of Labor policy, both at the state level, where you have seen, we have seen, well, honourable members can wave their fingers around as much as they like, but they should be waving them in the direction of Spring Street in Melbourne. The reality is that the gas crisis in Australia has been entirely created by Labor governments. There is no question about that. The failure to have regard to the needs of the domestic market was a failure of the, the last Perth Federal will leave Labor under government 94, eh? and a Labor government in Queensland. The Prime Minister has the call. Yeah. The failure to allow any exploration or development of Victoria's extensive onshore gas reserves is a political decision of the Victorian Labor government. We have a shortage of gas in Australia created by political decisions by Labor governments, and we are taking the hard decisions to resolve it. But they are, they are, it is a tough measure. One of the honourable members opposite laughs. Well, I wonder how he would laugh at the workers at Incitec Pivot in Brisbane, whose jobs are under threat because of the increase in gas prices created by Labor's recklessness and mindless approach to policy, allowing too much gas to be exported without having regard to the needs of the domestic market and, at the same time, campaigning against the exploration and development of gas in Victoria. The Labor Party's for track will leave record under 94. on energy is one of ideology and politics. That's all they have. We are now cleaning up their mess. We're providing the storage that they overlooked to talk about. We're delivering the gas security that they negligently put at risk. We're making the tough decisions to ensure that Australians will have affordable, reliable energy and that will meet our international commitments. Just before I call the member for Indi, I'm pleased to inform the House we have the President of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of New South Wales, the Honourable John Ajaka, and the Deputy Clerk. Mr Stephen Reynolds with us today. I extend a very warm welcome to you both. I'm also pleased to inform the House that we have in the gallery today the Honourable Natasha Files, Northern Territory Minister for Justice, Health and Attorney General. Again, on behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome. The Member for Indi. Thank you. Um, 
My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, Australian textile mills in Wangaratta is facing a 141 per cent increase in energy costs, and the timber manufacturer D&R Henderson in Benalla tell me they will pay a million dollars more for electricity 2017 than last year. And there are over 20,000 people in Indi employed in the manufacturing sector, and the loss of these jobs is a very real threat. Industry is willing the parliament to get on with good policy, combining affordability and sustainability. And while the Finkel Review provides an opportunity to deliver long-term energy security, what practical steps will the government take to address the immediate impacts of ballooning energy costs and the demand for renewables, particularly in my electorate of Indi? The Prime Minister has the call. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for a question. And regional communities like those that she represents contain the full spectrum of our economic life agriculture, manufacturing, mining, timber, tourism. Every, every aspect of our economic life is represented in her electorate and in the electorates of other members representing regional communities here. And affordable and reliable energy is absolutely critical to ensuring that those businesses which she spoke are able to continue to provide the jobs, provide the economic growth that her communities need. Now, this is what the government is doing right now in the here and now. The biggest single impact on wholesale prices at the moment has been the rapid increase in the price of gas. That has been driven by the shortages I spoke about a moment ago because of misguided decisions, reckless decisions made a long time ago by the previous Labor government, both here and in Queensland, to allow more gas to be exported than was available and, of course, the government, Labor government and the honourable members' state to prevent the exploitation of onshore gas resources in Victoria. So we have taken the tough decision to put export limits on gas. It is not one we take any pleasure in doing, but it will ensure that there is sufficient gas for the domestic market. At the same time, we are accelerating reforms to the way in which gas pipelines are run, because, of course, we want, need to see more transparency so that the cost of moving gas around the country comes down. That is another key component. We are also pushing the states to deliver on electricity market reforms. And we have the ACCC look as the, as the tough cop on the beat, looking at the way the electricity market operates, the retail market, and in particular, the honourable member would be well aware of concerns expressed by the Grattan Institute and others by the way in which retail margins have grown without any uh, explanation or justification in her state of Victoria. Now, at the same time, the honourable member asked about renewables. The key thing we need to have to make renewables reliable is storage, <laughs> completely overlooked by Labor. To my best of my knowledge, no mention ever made of it by the Labor Party and certainly overlooked uh, by the Victorian Labor government and most negligently of all by the South Australian Labor government. We have put that on the map. Not only that, we are going ahead with Snowy Hydro 2.0, which will add 350,000 megawatt hours of storage into the system, the largest introduction of pumped hydro in our history, all of which supports the increasingly distributed and variable generation of electricity, including in the honourable member's electorate. The member for Page. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Will the Minister update the House on why strong borders are a necessary part of our national security framework? And is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Pleased to report to the House that it's 1,053 days since we have had a successful people smuggling venture to this country, and it should be celebrated, Mr. Speaker. I know my colleagues are proud of the fact that we have been able to stop the boats. And, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that Labor presided over a complete mess. When John Howard left office in 2007, there were four people in detention, including no children. Labor's mess saw 50,000 people arrive on 800 boats, 17 new detention centres open, and thousands and thousands of children and adults put into detention. Now, we've seen today, Mr Speaker, 
after an action was taken in the Supreme Court in Victoria as a result of the disastrous policy set up by the Labor Party, an action taken against the Commonwealth, which has resulted in a settlement today of $70 million being paid to plaintiffs, represented by none other than the ambulance-chasing lawyer firm of Slater Gordon, who pocketed a neat $20 million. Now, I, there is a little bit of objection, a little bit of objection from opposite, because there were many of those who worked for Slater and Gordon, and there are others, of course, who have received benefits from Slater and Gordon. To this very day, Slater and Gordon is a donor, significant donor to the Labor Party. I think it's worth noting as part of this discussion, Mr. Speaker, because it is reality. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, this side of the parliament won't be making the mistakes that Labor and the Greens made when they were in government because 1,200 people drowned at sea. Now, you would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that Labor, that Labor would by now have learned their lesson. Have they? No. They have not because we know, Mr. Speaker, that the same people that presided over the mess that resulted in boats recommencing are the same people that are coming out opposed now to the changes we're proposing to tighten up citizenship in this country. None other, none other, Mr. Speaker, than the member for Watson, who was the Minister for Immigration. He presided over a record 83 boats arriving on his watch, carrying 6,600 people, and most disgracefully resulted in 1,100 children going into detention. Now, do you think he's learned his lesson? I don't think so, Mr. Speaker, because we know that, when, uh, as was reported in the Australian in 2013, reported, and I quote, new Immigration Minister Tony Burke says that people smugglers have outsmarted Australian efforts to turn boats back to Indonesia, warning the coalition plan would only succeed in towing, his quote, people around in circles in the Indian Ocean. There's only one party that's going around in circles, Mr Speaker. That is the Australian Labor Party. The Australian Labor Party, if they're elected at the next election, let me make this promise. Mark these words. If the Labor Party is elected at the next election, the boats under Labor will restart. The member for Solomon is warned as is the member for McEwen. Member for Port Adelaide. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the Finance Minister told Fran Kelly, and I quote, the price of electricity has been going up in recent times. It's projected to continue to go up and up and up if we do nothing. And also he said, and I quote again, we need to embrace this blueprint that has been put forward by Dr Finkel. Does the Prime Minister agree that if the energy policy paralysis continues, power prices will continue to go up and up and up under this government? The Minister for the Environment and Energy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the member for Port Adelaide should know better. The member for Port Adelaide should know better because he comes from the state of South Australia, where electricity prices have gone up and up and up, and even in his own electorate. Even in his own electorate, Adelaide Brighton, they employ 450 people in your electorate. 450 people, and they had a blackout for 36 hours. Did you hear an apology from the member for Port Adelaide? No. Did you hear an apology to the 450 workers in your own electorate? The reality is, when Labor was last in office, when Labor was last in office, the member for electricity and prices more than double, more than double. And the right now, Hotham. as the Prime Minister has acknowledged, the wholesale price is going up. And the wholesale price is going up, particularly because we are now exporting two-thirds of what we produce, and states like Victoria are sitting on 40 years worth of domestic gas reserves. And your friends in the Labor government in the Northern Territory, they have restrictions on unconventional gas extraction. They're sitting on 180 years worth of gas reserves. So I say to the member for Port Adelaide, we're all in favour of affordable, reliable energy. We're all in favour of affordable, reliable energy. But to do that, you need to drop your reckless 45 per cent emissions reduction targets, which the Business Council calls risky and unnecessary. You should not pursue your ideological approach to energy policy and you should come on board with important bipartisan initiatives like carbon capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage. 
because this is what the member for McMahon said. Carbon capture and storage projects are occurring throughout the world. This is what the member for Corio said. Carbon capture and storage is a critically important technology. And this is what Senator Penny Wong said. I'm on the record of supporting carbon capture and storage. So you can imagine how surprised we were to see a press release last night under the cover of everything else from the member for Port Adelaide saying they would not support, not support our amendments, our amendments to the Clean Energy Finance Corporation in order to support carbon capture and storage. We are all in favour of lower electricity prices and a more stable system, and you're much more likely to get that under Malcolm Turnbull and his government than Labor's ideological pursuits. The member for Moore has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will the Minister advise the House on why it is important to ensure the integrity of decision-making at the highest levels of government? Is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Foreign Affairs has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for more for this very important question. Mr Speaker, all governments have a responsibility to ensure that there is integrity in the decision-making processes, including at the highest levels. And in the case of the federal government, that means in the Cabinet and in the National Security Committee. The public must have confidence in these forums to ensure that decisions taken are in the national interest and on their merits. Mm -hmm. Mr Speaker, the fact is that when decisions are taken in these forums, those charged with the solemn duty of making national security decisions should be unencumbered by any obligation to any benefactor who may not have Member Australia's national interests Member at heart. Wills. And, Mr Speaker, the fact is that leaders of political parties have a particular responsibility to ensure and, in fact, follow every credible lead to ensure that their party is free from any obligations that could compromise Australia's national interest. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has failed this fundamental test. Yesterday it was revealed that the Shadow Minister for Agriculture, the member for Hunter, while serving in a previous Labor government as Australia's Minister for Defence and as a member of the National Security Committee, had a benefactor with alleged close links to a foreign intelligence service. And it was also revealed that the Department of Defence had grave concerns about the Minister for Defence and the nature of his relationship with this benefactor and the connection with a foreign intelligence service. Now, Mr Speaker, given that the member for Hunter remains on Labor's front bench and would be a cabinet minister in a shortened government, wouldn't you think that the Leader of the Opposition would be demanding a security briefing about these specific allegations of targeting a senior member of his leadership team by a foreign intelligence service? Mr Speaker, I can inform the House that the Leader of the Opposition has not sought such a briefing. 36 hours later, after these revelations, and the Leader of the Opposition has not sought a security briefing about these serious allegations. And, Mr Speaker, his failure to do so means the Leader of the Opposition is now personally compromised on national security. Member for Isaacs. The member for Burt has a call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Foreign Minister. What are the consequences for Australia standing on the world stage of one of the Liberal Party's biggest donors, mining magnate Sally Zhao, establishing a company called Julie Bishop Glorious Foundation? <laughs> and does the minister seriously Members expect left. the House to believe a Liberal donor who she knows well set up a company in the minister's name, the Julie Bishop Glorious Foundation, but never raised it with her on the many occasions that they met. 
Members on my left, the Minister for Foreign Affairs has the call. Minister for Foreign Affairs will resume her seat. Members on my left are preventing the Foreign Minister from answering the question. I will. Minister for Foreign Affairs resume her seat. I'm making it very clear now, the question having been asked, some people having their moments fun, there will be no interjections. The minister has the call. Mr Speaker, all donations to the Liberal Party are declared in accordance with the AEC obligations. Mr Speaker, until the matter was raised with me by the media a week ago, I had never heard of such a foundation. I say that in the solemnity of this parliament, I had never heard of such a foundation. Third point, Mr Speaker, at no time have I ever compromised government policy in relation to foreign affairs. I have never given in to any influence like Senator Sam Dastyari, who stands in stark contrast, who actually contradicted the opposition's policy on foreign affairs, who stood next to a Chinese benefactor, as I have never done, and publicly contradicted opposition policy on foreign affairs. Also, Mr Speaker, at no time have I ever had a benefactor who had alleged links with a foreign intelligence service while serving as the foreign minister, while serving on the National Security Committee. Mr Speaker, I know why the Labor Party is putting up this straw man argument, because the Leader of the Opposition has failed to investigate the very serious allegations against Senator Sam Dastyari, whom he then restored to his leadership position, and against the member for Hunter, who as Defence Minister of this country and as a member of the National Security Committee had a benefactor with alleged links to the Foreign Intelligence Service. Mr Speaker, I can stand here and be proud of my record. Labor is covered in shame. The member for Isaacs is now warned, and I remind the member for Goldstein he's warned, and the member for McEwen has already been warned, so he can leave under 94A. And I call the member for Wide Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the Deputy Prime Minister outline to the House how the Regional Investment Corporation will make it easier for farmers and investors to manage their finances and raise capital for investment? Is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any alternative approaches to raising finance? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Um, well, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question and, and note that even in the, around Maryborough there's been real concerns about the dry start to the sugar season and how that, uh, they didn't intend to get the crush that they expected at uh, the Maryborough sugar mills. And, of course, what this means is that we are always working with our farming community to make sure we get the very best, very, the very best outcome for them. We can't afford the interest rate subsidies anymore that we had in the past, but we can afford to uh, make available concessional loans, concessional loans which not only are better for the farmers at rates of 2.47 per cent, the lowest rate at the moment, but also put the competition on the banks. And you think with putting competition on the banks with the setup of the Regional Investment Corporation that we should have wide support, wide support to make sure that we get a very competitive price. And this is a this regional investment corporation has been a, a, a goal of the National Party, of regional Liberals, even the member for Kennedy for such a long period of time. But rather than talking about it, we're actually doing it. We're actually setting it up. And it's going to be capitalised, it's going to, it's going to have to be capitalised up to four billion dollars, two billion dollars in water infrastructure loans to build our dams and make our nation a stronger place, and $2 billion in concessional loans. It has the mandate in the future to expand where it goes. We'll be set up 
in the member for Clare seat in, uh, at Orange. Uh, Orange, where we've already got Paraguay Financial, part of Macquarie Bank. We've got a large section of the National Australia Bank's re rural investing unit set up there. We've got the Rural Assistance Authority. We've got the New South Wales Department of Agriculture to create a centre of excellence at Orange into financing. This, so, so we have a vision. We have a vision for creating Orange and making sure it grows as, a, as the premier venue for financing rural investments in Australia. And we're going to be part of that in this multiple billion dollar organisation and this is going to be part of that process as well. Now you also asked about whether there's alternate finance methods. And uh, look, I know that the, the, the Labor Party are flippant about this, but we must get to the bottom of exactly what connections are there between members of parliament, regardless of their side, and, and foreign and whether there's been foreign entities that have an influence on it. This is incredibly important. When on the front page of, the ma of a major yesterday it said, reveal, ALP donor linked to Chinese spy. This is yesterday. And we need to see that the member for Maribyrnong, the leader of the opposition, convince himself that he's completely across these details, especially with also questions regarding Senator Sam Dastyari. And it says in the paper, and I quote, in what is the first direct link between a donor in Australian politics and an operative of a foreign intelligence service, Fairfax Media can reveal one of Helen Liu's Australian companies sent $250,025 to a Hong Kong company that the American authorities believe was a front for Chinese espionage. Later on, it says, win copy of proprietary limited to Helen Liu's Australian company, which sent the money to Liu Chiang's firm in 1996, later gave $20,000 to concluded. <coughs> The Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. His time concluded about 10 seconds ago. The member for Blair has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration. Can the Minister please advise the House whether any coalition MPs have made representations about immigration matters to the Department or the Minister on behalf of Liberal or National Party donors? And if so, will he advise the House which coalition MPs have made these representations? The Minister for Immigration, the Member for Hunter, will cease interjecting. The well, member Mr. For Speaker, Hunter uh, will cease interjecting. Firstly, thank you to the Member for Blair. This is his uh, inaugural question. 300 odd days. Well done. Well done. Out of all the questions he could have asked, I mean, how do we stop boats? How do we get kids out of detention? How do we stop the drownings at sea? He's had 300, 300 days to think of a question, and he comes up with a dud question like this. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me answer it directly. Let me answer it directly. So he's referring to some revelations, as I understand it, uh, were broadcast on the ABC's Four Corners program recently, which made allegations in relation to Senator Sam Dastyari making approaches to my department in relation to citizenship on behalf of a particular individual. I don't have any comment to make in relation to that allegation, Mr Speaker. All I will say, as I deal frequently with, for example, a member for uh, uh, McMahon, uh, would write dozens of letters to me each month. He speaks to me on a regular basis in relation to his constituents, and if he has a case with merit, we provide support. And on occasions, people I can look at on the front bench including on our front bench and, uh, and uh, on the back benches, have come to us with cases in relation to their constituents. Now, I have, Mr Speaker, as you would expect, as immigration ministers past have done, uh, we will look into those cases and, if they're with merit, we can provide them with support. Now, I would be completely blind to whether or not, for example, a member for McMahon had any financial relationship with somebody he was present. Now, I, I, can say, I can say, Mr Speaker, I can say that I believe the honourable member to be absolutely honourable, and I would take the representations that he puts to me on face value, as I do with every other member in this place. And that's the reality, Mr. Speaker. If people have, as members of Parliament, presented to us cases that they want uh, assistance with, we have looked at those cases. Now, if the honourable member has specific cases that he wants to put to me, I'm happy to investigate them. Happy to. Uh, uh, to look at them, but if he's just attempting to throw mud, then I think he should look first. I think he should look first to Senator Sam Dastyari in the Senate, and he should also look at a couple of others on the front bench uh, that I think might have a little bit of uh, form in this area. 
The member for Hughes has My the question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on how the Governor is acting to improve integrity in Australia's taxation system? And how is the Government's tax integrity package announced in the Budget working to combat fraud? The Treasurer has the call. Speaker, I thank, thank the member for his question and his keen interest in ensuring that our taxism has integrity. And he will know that it has been this government that introduced the multinational anti-avoidance laws, which have already in this financial year will be clawing back some $2.9 billion from multinational companies. Now, this is the legislation that was opposed by the Labor Party. I don't know which multinationals they are acting for and are opposing this legislation, Mr. Speaker, but they oppose that legislation. And that legislation is already yielding some $2.9 billion in additional tax liabilities coming into the tax coffers of this country because of the action taken by this government. But in this budget, we have gone further and we're acting further, Mr. Speaker. Our Black Economy Task Force is addressing the cash economy, and we have accepted the recommendations, the first tranche of those, from the Black Economy Task Force, which includes payments being made to con by con two contractors being reported and outlawing the manufacture, distribution, and possession, sale or of, of uh, technology that suppresses the sales and income which is being received by contractors and others. We've abolished all capital gains tax exemptions for foreign investors in residential real estate in this country, and we've tightened up the withholding tax arrangements and we've restored the caps on foreign ownership of residential real estate that were lifted by the Labor Party when they were in office. But another thing we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we are stopping tax fraud in the gold and precious metals industry. We are putting an end to the blatant and criminal tax activity that has already cost taxpayers over $860 million to date. Now we read today, Mr. Speaker, that the gold-plated fraud, the gold-plated fraud which we're acting to stop, has wormed its way into the Australian Labor Party. At the last election, Labor recruited Simon Show who was reported to have channelled $140,000 from dodgy gold deals into the coffers of the Labor Party, Mr Speaker. And guess he was, he was recruited to join the Senate ticket with Sam Dastiari, Shanghai Sam, Mr Speaker. So we have Shanghai Sam and a would-be Labor senator, Labor's own Goldfinger, Mr Speaker, who wanted to become Gold member of the Australian Parliament, Mr Speaker. It only leads you to wonder who's the mini-me of the Leader of the Opposition over there and who is number two, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, really working for, Mr Speaker, at the end of the day. But the real question for the Leader of Opposition is this. Will the Labor Party set aside that $140,000 in a trust account so it can be accessed by the Australian Taxation Office as a result of their investigations into this gold fraud, Mr Speaker, or is the Leader of the Opposition going to hang on to Labor's ill-gotten gains? Just before I call the next question, I just want to make clear to members on many occasions I've said members need to refer to each other by their correct titles. That also applies to senators, and that's not a widely known fact, but I'm making it very clear now that uh, the practice to refer to members and senators by their correct titles is quite long-standing. The member for Blacksland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Foreign Minister, and I refer to reports that the former Minister for Trade, Andrew Robb, began working for the Chinese company Landbridge before the last election a part-time position that earns him $880,000 a year. Has the Foreign Minister sought advice from the Secretary of her department about whether Mr Robb breached the Prime Minister's statement of ministerial standards, which imposes restrictions on post-ministerial employment? And if not, why not? The Leader of the House on a point of order. Mr Speaker. Members on my left. Mr Speaker. The, the Member for Lindsay is warned. Mr. Speaker, the question. I, the Leader of the House, I will now hear. Members will not interject. Mr. Speaker, the question isn't in order because the uh, person concerned ended being a member of Parliament on May the 9th, 2016, when the writs were issued for the election. Uh, how he earned income after that is not the responsibility of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and therefore the question is not within her responsibilities, and as a consequence, she can't answer. He wasn't the Minister for Trade on the 1st of July 2016. He stopped being a Member of Parliament on May the 9th, 2016. I'll hear from the 
I am ready to rule, but in, in interest of fairness, I'll hear from the manager of uh, opposition business. Member for Wills just either take his seat or leave the chamber. I oh, know I, I get a sore back too, but but I, I keep thinking you're, you're wanting the call. Okay, the manager of opposition business on on, on, on two points, if I may. First of all, in terms of the tenor of question time today, I think it's a bit late for the Leader of the House to get precious on a day like this. Yeah. Well, on the second I point of the order, on the, issue, on the issue of ministerial please, members responsibility. Members on my right, on the issue of ministerial no, I say, I'm, I've, got, I'm, <laughs> I've got the call for a second. I say to the manager of opposition business, I know emotions run high, but I'm going to rule on whether the question's in order or not. And the standing orders don't vary according to the, mo the emotion of the place, I have to say. The manager of opposition business can proceed. Yep. The second issue I wanted to raise, Mr Speaker, goes to the fact that the foreign minister today is in the House as the representative of the Minister for Trade. Mm. The question goes as to whether or not advice has been sought from the department secretary mm. as to whether or not a breach subsequently occurred. And the relationship between a minister and the secretary of a department the can Leader of the House can just resume his seat. He's not going to get the call any earlier. By a question there. about whether or not a minister has sought advice from the Secretary of a Department must be in order. Here, here. I'll just ask the Leader of the House to resume his seat for a second, because I've heard both the Leader of the House and the Manager of Opposition Business. I listened very closely to the question, and I could see the Leader of the Opposition a Leader of the House wanted the call, as did the Manager of Opposition Business. I have a different problem with the question, and that is it relates to the ministerial standards for which the Prime Minister is responsible. That's my difficulty with the question. So on that basis, I am going to rule it out, but make it very clear if that question was directed to the Prime Minister, who is responsible for ministerial standards. Uh, that question, no, that's, that, that is a matter for ministers. I've made that clear. I'm not going to take appeals by way of interjections. I'm making it very clear. I've heard the manager of the opposition business patiently and the leader of the house. That's my ruling on the question. We'll go to the next question and I'll call the member for right. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry, representing the Minister for Employment. My, uh, will the minister outline the house why it's important that employer and employee organisations always act in the best interest of their members? And is the minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Defence Industry has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for right for his question. Mr Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is very fond of lecturing the government about foreign donations. Uh, but what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And the Leader of the Opposition presides over a front bench that includes the reinstated Senator Sam Dastyari, a person, Mr Speaker, who didn't just solicit donations for the Labor Party from foreign donors but had his personal debts paid by donors. His personal debts paid by donors. And within a matter of months, Mr Speaker, Senator Dastyari was reinstated to the Labor Party front bench. So this side of the House is not going to take any lectures from the Leader of the Opposition or the Labor Party about donations. And in fact, I noticed, Mr Speaker, in The Australian today, it's reported that in the financial year 06-07, the AWU National Office received a $27,500 donation from Australian Super, an industry fund. And in the same year, the AWU donated $25,000 to the leader of the opposition's campaign, his first campaign for Maribyrnong. Just a coincidence, of course. Another Deirdre Chambers moment for the leader of the opposition. He has a fear of those. But the problem, Mr Speaker, is that the leader of the opposition at the time was both the director of Australian Super and the national secretary of the AWU. And under the Corporations Act, Mr. Speaker, it's his duty to ensure he puts the interests of retiree fund members first, not his own interests, Mr. Speaker. So whose interest was he putting first? But this morning, Mr. Speaker, the AWU says, wait, it was all an error. It wasn't really a donation. All another coincidence, another one of the Leader of the Opposition's Deirdre Chambers moments, which we've become so accustomed. So perhaps the Leader of the Opposition could explain the other seven donations received by the AWU National Office in 0607, coincidentally the same year that he was campaigning for election as the member for Maribyrnong, uh, and for which were recorded as donations apparently in error. The $11,000 from CBUS, the superannuation fund. $16,500 from the Macquarie Equity Bank, $22,000 from IUS, 
$17,500 from one steel, $15,400 from Smorgan Steel, $16,500 from Visi, all recorded as donations, obviously all recorded in error by a man called Michael Chen, who was the financial controller of the AWU, who, in the leader of the opposition's maiden speech, he described as one of the smartest people I know. <laughs> one of the smartest people I know, Mr Speaker, but not so smart uh, with, with return to the AEC donations from the AWU, Mr Speaker. Now, these payments represent a significant conflict of interest, and the Leader of the Opposition has to explain what were those payments for, the why were they erroneously time has recorded. Concluded. The Member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Member for Fadden was forced to resign after it was revealed that, while he was Assistant Defence Minister, he promoted a deal between a major Liberal Party donor and a Chinese government-owned mining company. Has the Prime Minister obtained any advice about whether the disgraced former Assistant Defence Minister's conduct may have jeopardised Australia's national security, and will the Prime Minister rule out reappointing him to the front bench? Members on my right will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. The member for Bowman will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Well, I thank the, uh, I thank the honourable member for his question, which comes as more of yet another example of the abuse he prefers to use question time for. The, the members on my the, left, manager, the, uh, manager of opposition business. I'd say to the, I'd say to the honourable member. I'd say to the honourable member that the maintenance of the compliance with ministerial standards is the highest priority. I maintain, I maintain the maintenance of those ministerial standards, and all as far as future ministerial appointments, the honourable member should understand that I will always ensure that ministerial standards are complied with, both prospectively and, of course. Uh, in the past and dealt with appropriately in, in accordance with those standards. And I, re I reject the, the shabby smear that the honourable <laughs> member chose to use his question for. Mm. The member for Barker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for the Environment and Energy. I refer the Minister to a large manufacturer in my electorate which directly employs 350 people. This business is in danger of closing down because its gas bill is set to double in the next financial year. Minister, can you advise the House what is being done to address this issue of gas supply and affordability? And is the Minister aware of any alternative approaches? The Minister for the Environment and Energy has the call. The Member for Whitlam is warned. I thank the Member for Barker for his question and acknowledge his deep concern about the rising power prices and the impact on households and businesses from Mount Gambia to Millicent, some of whom I have met with the member for Barker. He understands that gas is a critical part of our economic security. Indeed, it provides about 20 per cent of our electricity. It is a vital feedstock for industry and it is an important transition fuel. And gas prices have increased by about threefold over the last five years. That is why, under the Turnbull government, we are taking a number of steps to put downward pressure on gas prices including export controls, export restrictions to reserve more for domestic use. We are also putting through reforms through the COAG process to lower the costs for transportation, Mr Speaker, as well as that we had a $90 million package in our recent budget to incentivise further investment. But during, I'm asked am I aware of any alternative approaches, and during the Labor Party's time in office, they saw major financial investment decisions taken for the three gas projects at Gladstone. Now, the member for Port Adelaide earlier this year went on Insiders and he was asked by Barry Cassidy, you were in government four years ago and you got plenty of advice then that the surge in exports would lead to these sort of problems, but you didn't take this action. Now, this is important to listen. This is what the member for Port Adelaide said. No, we didn't get that advice. Now, I ask myself, what level of advice did the member for Port Adelaide get about the LNG industry and its impact? So I looked at the Australian Energy Market Operators Report for 2012. Under a headline, LNG Market Impacts, 
The LNG export market is having a significant impact on the domestic market. Potential supply shortfalls to domestic markets may be seen. Mr. Speaker. That's the advice. And in an energy paper put out by the Labor government in 2012, and it said in a highlighted area, LNG export industry will lead to transitional pressures. Listen to this. Will manifest in tighter supply and higher prices, Mr. Speaker. Transition pressures will manifest in tighter supply and higher prices. So the member for Port Adelaide has gone on television and said he didn't get any advice. And both a emo in 2012 and his own energy white paper in 2012 gave me advice. I think this is a smoking gun. The member for Port Adelaide should come into this place and apologise because he has been given advice the about the problems time has his concluded. party has created. The Leader of the Opposition has the call. Uh, my question is to the Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister really opposes foreign donations, why has the Coalition voted against banning foreign donations three times in previous parliaments? And will the Prime Minister agree to bring Labor's private member's bill, bring it on for a vote in the House today, so we can ban foreign donations once and for all? The member for McKellar will cease interjecting. The member for McKellar is warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, I think honourable members would take the Leader of the Opposition more seriously on foreign donations. Were it not for the fact that when Sam da Senator Dastiari took a donation to himself, personal bills. a personal donation to himself from a Chinese donor, and then proceeded to do a switch on Labor's policy on the South China Sea at a press conference in the Commonwealth parliamentary offices in Sydney at two lecterns, each of which have the Australian coat of arms on it, a disgraceful performance of cash for comment and a clear policy switch, and the Leader of the Opposition stood him down from the uh, front bench for six months. Six months. That's how seriously he took it. Now, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I made a commitment at the beginning of this year that we would ban foreign donations, and I did that. And the Labor's bill. Labor's bill you could drive a truck through, an absolute truck through, and we will be introducing legislation in the spring sessions that deals with it. Now, as honourable members would be well aware, it is important, in the light of the findings of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, that any such ban is comprehensive and is not simply limited to political parties and applies to other political organisations like GetUp like the unions, and is a comprehensive ban so that only Australians Australian businesses have the ability to have a say through donations into the political contest. We're, doing, we're committed to doing that. The Labor Party's track record in this area is demonstrated manifestly by Senator Dastiari's case. Let's not forget he solicited money from a foreign donor he accepted it. It was given to him, not because he was a nice guy, not because he was hard up, but because he was a senator. He got that privileged payment. He used his position to get that payment, and then he switched the policy, uh, opposed the stand, long-standing policy of the Labor Party on a vitally important issue of national security. And for all of that, he was in the sin bin for six months. The Leader of the Opposition has got a long way to go before anyone will take him seriously on foreign donations. The member for Parramatta is warned and the member for Swan has the call. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Justice and Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Counterterrorism. Will the Minister update the House on what the government is doing to protect vulnerable children from child sex offenders both in Australia and overseas? 
The members on my right will cease interjecting. No, I'm listening to the question, and there's a wall of interjections from both sides. I've listened to the question, and I'm now calling the Minister for Justice. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Swan for that question? Uh, and he knows that the government will not tolerate the exploitation of vulnerable children, whether it occurs here in Australia or whether it occurs overseas. And this morning, this government has introduced legislation that will stop registered child sex offenders from travelling overseas to commit unspeakable acts of depravity. This is a world first and the strongest crackdown on child sex tourism ever. No other country has ever taken such strong and decisive action to stop its citizens from leaving its borders to abuse children overseas. Now, once this bill is passed, it will allow the Department of Foreign Affairs to take immediate action to cancel the passports of registered child sex offenders for the duration of their reporting requirements under the National Child Offender Register. Last year alone, we know that 780 people who were on that register travelled overseas. So far this year, the figure is almost 400, which is two offenders leaving Australia per day, and one third of those offenders travelled without permission, which is in clear breach of the reporting obligations uh, and is a sure sign of ill intent. Now, these offenders often travel to vulnerable countries where they don't have the same laws, the same cultures, or the same policing capability, to, and therefore this provides a more permissive environment for people to abuse children. Now, this government will continue to do what we can to protect vulnerable children, both overseas and here in Australia. And last night we saw a milestone pass through this House, the Protecting Minors Online Bill, which is also known as Carly's Law. Now, Carly, this law is named after Carly Ryan, who was a 15-year-old South Australian schoolgirl who was raped and murdered 10 years ago by a 50-year-old man who had posed online as a 20-year-old man. And the passing of this bill is a testament to her mother, Sonia Ryan, who has used the intervening 10 years to campaign for the greater protection of children online. And this is a testament to her efforts once this bill passes through this parliament. Now, the offence will provide police with the power to intervene before predators have a chance to act or before a child can be harmed. Now, Carly's law, once passed, will complement this government's ongoing approach to countering the sexual exploitation of children online, which is spearheaded by the Australian Federal Police's Think You Know program, which educates students, parents and teachers about the dangers online. Mr Speaker, these two bills will be substantial steps forward for the protection of children here in Australia and overseas as well. Both of these pieces of legislation are enhance the protection of children, and I urge the House to deal with them as expeditiously as possible. The Prime Minister. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice. I thank the Prime Minister.